Hello and welcome to Dateline New Haven. I'm your host, Paul Bass, inviting you to look behind the headlines on the stories that make New Haven tick. Stacy Graham Hunt is making New Haven tick with a gripping new book called Processing Pain. Stacy grew up here. The essays in her new book tell what that was like and what it's like coming of age. Welcome to the studio, Stacy. Thank you. And we'd like to thank Yale New Haven Hospital for providing support for today's program. Stacy, before I ask you a bunch of questions, I want you to give, if you don't mind, our listeners a taste of what it's like to be reading your new book and why I asked you to come here to talk about it. Sure. So, so Stacy, you'll be reading an excerpt from Processing Pain, her new book. The name of this personal essay is called Afterbirth. When you go see the movie Birth of a Nation and then return home to your city that's 8% black, where your upstairs neighbor, a white male, continually tries to convince your black dad why he and other black people should vote for Trump, a misogynistic man with a history of racial discrimination lawsuits, where another neighbor, who's a white cop, has only spoken to you once in the three years you've lived next door to him. That one time was because you said hello first. When you sit through that same two-and-a-half-hour movie and watch white men rape, hang, shoot, kill, buy, sell, force feed, and knock the teeth out of black men and women, and you know the movie was based on a true story, an American story, about Nat Turner, a black slave who led a rebellion in the 1800s, killing about 60 white slave owners, many of whom were were guilty of the crimes I just mentioned. When you get home from this movie and then can only stomach 20 minutes of Ava DuVernay's Netflix documentary, 13th, about how white Americans found a loophole in the 13th Amendment, which has legally allowed them to enslave and criminalize black people on minor charges, throw them into prison, and put them to work so that your country, which was once great, can thrive economically and hopefully one day become great again like it was during slave times. When the next day you sit at your laptop and wonder if by typing up and sharing this honest regurgitation of thoughts and feelings, you will in fact be considered the aggressor, despite all of the passive aggressions made towards you on a daily basis as a result of your skin color or hair texture. But at the same time, you know, God made you an emotionally sensitive black woman and gave you a storytelling superpower which you're still trying to figure out because he knew you would write all of these experiences in a way that people could understand and perhaps cause them to evaluate and change their own beliefs and behaviors. When you try to imagine what it's like to be free from thinking about your skin color or hair texture just for a day, and you remember having that freedom in a few other countries you've visited, but it hurts your soul that you don't have this freedom in your own home, in your own neighborhood, in your own city, state, or country. Maybe I'll just move, I always say to myself, but who will stay and change things? We're already fleeing our own neighborhoods, leaving them in despair and letting gentrification be. That was Stacey Graham Hunt from her new book, Processing Pain. I recommend it. I read it myself and enjoyed it a lot. Well, enjoy, I guess that's a funny word to use when you talk about someone's pain. But I, you, you do some, not that it's vicarious their pain, it's that you're feeling something when you're reading it and getting to know somebody. Stacey, the reason I, and thank you for reading that, the reason I asked you to read that part was not to give people a representative taste of the book because it's not. This comes at the end, and this is that's sort of essay writing about what you think about what's going on in the world. And in fact, the book is very personal. It's a series of essays that things have happened specifically in your life. Yes which I found compelling. And I got to, even though I met you before and talked to you, I felt like I got to know you a lot better from reading it. But the reason I wanted to read that first was to show people what we're working with. Someone who can really write, someone who has a certain take on the world based on her lived experience. But we're going to talk now about what's in the book. Okay. I, people know, I just want people to know how you write. By the way, 8% black. So that was not New Haven. What's and your, Sonia. Oh, and Sonia. And I was, I've always been interested in Sonia because it's always had a black community. It, um, you know, I know that a lot of black community left after the flood of what was it? 55. I'm not sure. I, I've lived there for about three and a half in the valley. years. Yeah. So there are always this long standing black community. A lot of it, if I'm not mistaken, is is centered near a housing development that's getting knocked down. Yes. But um, but it's always been there, but a little hidden because it's eight percent. It's not forty eight percent or thirty eight percent. Correct. And uh, but we had, we do have a, it, the independent does have a valley edition. Yes. Valley Sentinel. And mm-hmm. How are things in it, Sony? Do you like living there? Um, it's okay. Um, I miss you know the diversity of New Haven. And there's not as much to do 
you know, out in Ansonia. So it's kind of where I just camp out. You know? why, why do you live there? Um, so interestingly enough, I was married and then I got divorced and then I needed a place to live like quickly. And um, a family friend, um, she said, I have an apartment. And it happened to be in my price range. And I had a dog, and she said, you can bring your dog. And so I, I was sold on the apartment. What it's, do they charge a month in, in Sonia? Um, I think it's about $700, $800. It's much cheaper than... For a one-bedroom or two a studio? Bedrooms. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so you can really get yeah. <laughs> And is it like a safe neighborhood and everything? Yeah, my neighborhood is pretty safe. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. You know, I've been hearing a lot about that, about New Haven's becoming a place where either you need to have some real bucks to rent because it costs a lot, or you need to be really poor and on public assistance That's where they also charge an incredible amount. Like I live in a house, mm-hmm. a full house, not a big house, in Westville with uh, four bedrooms, small bedrooms, about 50, 1,700 square feet. I pay less for that whole house than someone living in a housing pro- a rundown housing project on Section 8 is paying for a two- or three-bedroom wow. apartment. Now, I believe it because even when I was looking for apartments in New Haven... Um, they're easily fifteen hundred dollars for a one bedroom, wow. and you can't bring your dog. And, wow! You know. So that's what we're seeing is that the affordable housing has really gone out to the valley and the inner ring. Some of the yes, inner ring suburbs. and Waterbury. Yeah, people yeah. move to Waterbury. That's interesting. And so, before we get to some of the specific stories in your book, Stacy, how did you get the idea to write this book? Now, you've been a journalist, and so did you grow up in Hamden, in New Haven. Is I that grew fair? up in yes, Hamden, in New Haven. I was born in New Haven. I lived there for like my elementary years, and then we, my family, moved to Hamden. Right, and you write about going to Lincoln Bassett School. Uh, I went to St. Thomas's. Oh, St. Thomas. And I went to um, Hopkins. I thought that you were getting picked up from school at Lincoln Bassett. I guess there was. I went to. Um, I don't know if I wrote. I don't think I wrote about this in the book, but I did go to someone's house after school. I would get oh, watched okay. Okay, over right there. Okay. But um, and she, her family, uh, some of her brothers went to Lincoln Bassett. I thought. I thought. I read the book a couple weeks ago, but I thought you were getting picked up by your father because your mother was working. Mm-hmm. That was that was either at St. Thomas's Thomas or yeah. So you went to some of the really elite schools. Yes. But you lived in what you say a working the middle class family. The yeah, family. my family they worked. They worked. Both were working. Both were working. My mom, um, she was a nurse, and my dad. He always had like a business job that he always had to explain to me two and three times. Um, he basically is a buyer to say it uh, succinctly, but um, he negotiates contracts for um, the supplies that his companies need. Mm-hmm. So. so what gave you the idea of writing this book? So I had no intentions of writing a book. Um, I had this inclination, gut feeling, God, um, telling me that I need to share um, some of these experiences that happened to me, some of my most embarrassing moments, and I kept putting it off. <laughs> and putting it off because who wants to do that? Um, and so... Eventually, you know, I got to a place where I was like, fine. And so I shared the first story. This is on Facebook. I shared the first story on Facebook. And I started with... So you wrote a whole chapter in a Facebook post? Yes. Some people have been doing that. We had a guy in Tim, I forget his name. He has a pretty best-selling, uh, high-selling book now. And he's on the national TV shows. He's a story in Yale about what he feels are the dangers with the Trump administration. He started out as a Facebook post that went wild. That mm-hmm. was an essay. Yeah, I had no intentions of writing a book. I had no intentions of sharing any of these stories. Um, but I started with the first one, which was about my great-grandfather passing away from Alzheimer's. And it got a great response, even though I was really you know, nervous about it and felt like I was sharing too much inf- way too much information on Facebook. Um, and people were writing me and saying, you know, thank you for writing that and my father died or my so-and-so died when I was young and I've been having a hard time processing that and because of that relationship lost I'm having these issues in my personal relationships now so it gave me the courage to post another story and then every time I thought I was sharing you know a scary story someone would share an even scarier story with me so it made me feel like I wasn't alone and it made me it gave me the courage to continue sharing. You know, it's so interesting when you talk about your embarrassing moments. And it is tender and you are vulnerable when when you write about stuff like being close to your grandfather and feeling guilt over mm-hmm. when he dies, wanting to go for the Alzheimer's, or terrible, tough relationship with your mother, or as we get into it, an abortion, and a, and a kid who treated you skanky when you were <laughs> dating him in high school. What's interesting to the reader 
And I think it's like when you hear someone just tell you their bad story, what's embarrassing to you is, is so often not embarrassing in the view of the person who reads it. That's true. I read that and I say, what in the world would she be embarrassed about? I understand why it'd be painful. I understand why it wasn't her happiest moment, but I can't even find anything remotely embarrassing about the grandfather's death you were close to or the tough relationship with your mom or the abortion. I understand why it's private right. and painful. Yeah. I mean, that's part, maybe that's part of the process of sharing our painful stories, whether it's in a book or Facebook post or conversation, is that maybe one way we heal through telling painful stories is to get that outside reinforcement that other people have gone through the stuff too. And, Absolutely. And we didn't do anything wrong. Absolutely. And it doesn't make us bad. Right. And I think I needed that. I didn't know I needed it at the time, but um, it was very helpful, especially, you know, with the story of Vagina Gate. Which we're um, definitely going to get the vagina again. I'm saving that up for later <laughs> in the show. Um, I was holding that in for so long. And like, I stopped dating people for a while because I was like, this is never, I'm never going to go through an experience like this again. Um, so going through that and writing about it and feeling all of that again, and then to have people look at the perpetrator and not me, it was like, Oh, good. Like, I, maybe I didn't do anything. Okay, now you anticipated where I'm going with Vagina Gate. <laughs> you know what? Let's get right to Vagina okay. Gate. I'm sick of Trump Gate and Russia Gate <laughs> and Watergate. Let's get to Vagina Gate. So, Stacey Graham Hunt, in her new book, Processing Pain, which you can buy, go to processingpain.com. Yes. Okay. Stacey, why don't you read an excerpt about Vagina Gate? It involved your freshman year boyfriend. I, it's weird that you called him a boyfriend in this. But anyway, a freshman year <laughs> boyfriend, according to you, Kwame. Yes. Who put out a nasty word about how you smell. Yes. And uh, page 39. Yes. And okay. this is an excerpt from the, and you're hearing the scandal unraveled here. <laughs> WNHH's Dateline New Haven at 103.5 FM, live streamed at newhavenindependent.org. Author Stacy Graham Hunt is now going to read from her new book, Processing Pain, the section about vagina gate. There was only one girl who had enough courage to confront me and ask me straight up what happened. We were waiting for our parents to pick up, pick us up after school one day. Did you let Kwame finger you, she asked. Yes, I said confidently. Well, he's telling everyone you stink, she said, just like that. She never talked to me again after that. I didn't respond. I didn't have any words. I felt betrayed by Kwame, embarrassed that the girl brought it to me like that, even if she was the only person to confront me. I also felt betrayed by my classmates, who were supposedly my friends, but ditched our relationships for a good laugh. I've, I was humiliated, and they were laughing. My ex-friends, insisting that I had a smelly vagina, seemed like too big of a mountain to move. I was already dealing with other mountains. My parents were splitting up. My great-grandmother, the matriarch, matriarch of our family, had died, and I was still adjusting to my grandmother's death from the previous year. Dodging vaginal disses at the same time was a lot. I did, not com I did not care about how complex vaginas were at the time and that practically anything could throw off their scent. New soap, old soap, medication, foods, beverages, using new laundry detergent on towels, not washing enough, excessive washing, physical activity, tight pants the day before you, your period, the days after your period, your actual period, wearing panties at night, a cold or other illness. I didn't care. And neither did my classmates. The poom poom is so unforgiving, my friend once said, imitating her Jamaican mother. The truth was that I did wash my ass before I met Kwame at the beach that day. I was excited about hooking up with him. I felt very prepared. But according to Kwame and a bunch of my classmates, I wasn't. According to them, I was this smelly chick. Everything eventually died down by my junior year, but sophomore year was hell to say the least. Because of my experience with Kwame, I wouldn't let any guy near any part of my body. I didn't want to give anyone the opportunity to agree with Kwame's findings. All right. And that was Stacey Graham Hunt talking about an episode that was very painful in her life and lasted years. You were at Hopkins School. You were a freshman. This was your first boyfriend. Yes. You had, and when you said hooking up, it's not what we mean now. You didn't mean having intercourse. No, no, no. You're having your first kind of petting. Yes. And he, what they call, go to third base. Yes. And then he told everyone about it. And then you guys weren't hanging out anymore and he started saying it's because you smelled skanky yes and he talked about what your vagina smelled like and everyone started and saying he, nasty mm -hmm. things to you and going away from you yes and he didn't tell me first 
he told, and he didn't even go to my school. Um, so he told like yeah, our common friends, our common friends at school, and they didn't avoid me. They would just laugh at me, and you didn't know why they were. And laughing. I didn't know why they were laughing at first, and then, and, okay. and and then it just um, eventually the girl I just mentioned, she we were after school, and she was my friend. And but you said that it affected you for quite a while. It did. You didn't it, date other boys for a while, mm-mm. or if I did have a boyfriend, like I wouldn't kiss them, I wouldn't let them touch me in any way. Um, not until I got to college, so. That was sophomore. And it was all because of vagina All game. because of this guy. And isn't it interesting when we're, we're so vulnerable? I mean, because anything sexual, you're vulnerable your whole life. Mm-hmm. I mean, just anyone knowing about you or talking about you could make you feel terrible. Right. But especially when you're an adolescent, just coming to grips with your changing body and the scary world of sex and the height, the fishbowl of social relationships in high school where every slight or who likes whom can make your self-worth just jump up and down. And it's so magnified, and because we were at Hopkins, and our and it was such a small school, an elite school, mm-hmm. and, and um, status. Is I don't a think the there. whole school knew. I think it was just our group. But right? in your mind, I'm sure you felt I, like the in whole my world mind, knew. it felt like the whole city and state knew. And so, the, what I found part, what I found interesting about this story, Stacy, is that it's still written from the perspective, and I think that's part of what's powerful about your essays. You get in the head of the teenager. And you're not really, in my opinion, when you wrote the story, you didn't step back to say what it looks like to someone who's in their 30s, right? You're in your mid-30s? Yes. And it's so obvious that Kwame was an idiot, right? <laughs> but and boys are idiots, right? Males, anything but sex, are idiots their whole life, and teenage boys are incredible idiots, right? Yes. And so, obviously, and tell me if I'm wrong, when I'm reading between the lines of the story, here was a kid who was nervous with a girl for the first time, and he really didn't know what to do. And he, he kind of felt very inadequate so the way he felt inadequate not knowing what to do was to trash her to feel big to boast that he had gone to third base with her and then put her down and say her vagina smelled skanky would you think that's a fair way of putting it it's a it's definitely fair and reasonable i never considered that's not to make him sound more sympathetic i think it's worse that he did that but that's how i read it as the male who's 57 okay But the other thing that struck me about it was one thing I didn't know being a male was that you you and others go to this effort to affect how your vagina was going to smell. Yes. And why is it? It's almost like it's a given that there's something wrong with the way one smells naturally. Um, I think that's society. I think. I mean, even if you that's crazy. Even if you go on like Instagram, you see memes about this. People joke about this and. Even the when time. they're not 16 years old? Or Even when they're not old? 16 years old. So what's the idea that People vaginas about... aren't supposed to smell like vaginas? What are they supposed to smell like? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the part I didn't get from your story. This is vagina gate to me. Right. Now, obviously, this I'm is sure... Still, there I mean, of, this is the adults talking about And I'm about sure this. that the feminism yeah. wave of the 70s embraced that, right? Mm-hmm. Our bodies, ourselves. Yes. And we're not supposed to shave our hair, our armpits. Right. We're not supposed to conform to something that's not natural and that what's beautiful is natural. I don't think everybody feels that way. But even when they're grown up. Even when they're grown up. Because I don't know anyone, I think, who would say that. That vagina smells skanky. Or that that's something to be embarrassed right. about or you don't say about something. I've heard celebrities talk about other celebrities and say things like that about them. Why? Just to be mean. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess you're right. There's sometimes this social pressure about yeah. being unnatural. Mm-hmm. And by the way, we are on Facebook Live and... um. Ashley Carroll writes in, go Stacy, two exclamation points. Hi, Ashley. Joyce Fountain says, we're lo- watching and cheering you on. And Stylene Aponte says, New Haven is very expensive for such a poor city. Word, we're talking about uh, <laughs> rents. And congrats on your book. Thank you, Stylene. So so what about when you look back at Vagina Gate now? What do you think in writing, did anything change in how you viewed it in your mid-30s when you wrote this and published it for the whole world to hear? Something that was humiliating for you for people to hear back then thank god it was before facebook can you imagine i know i Um, thought about that what how was it different writing about it and publishing a story about it now um writing about it so i felt all of those feelings again i could put myself right back at hopkins i pictured myself you know talking to kwame on the phone so that's why it comes out you know as if i'm this 14 year old because I felt all Which is of good writing, which is getting us in your head at that moment and understanding how a 14-year-old sees it. Yes. I felt all of that again. And then I think when I 
this was probably the hardest story for me to publish. So when I hit the post button, as I felt with all my stories, you know, I got real, my hands always would get really sweaty and, um, you know, my chest would get tight. And I felt all of that again. And I even remember sharing this with one of my friends before I posted it. And she was like, oh, my gosh, you can't share that one. I was like, I have to. It's already, you know, I have to get this out. So I posted it and um, I just waited, waited to see what was going to happen, waited to see what the response was going to be. And when people were... You posted it on Facebook. They posted it on Facebook. And when people were kind of attacking Kwame, um, felt kind of good. <laughs> <laughs> you got your revenge on Kwame 20 years later. Um, but also, you know, they... A lot of the women were like, you know, thank you for saying this because we go through so much as women and, you know, we have to keep up, you know, our bodies and do all of this stuff. And it's hard. It can be hard. So um, so I felt a little bit of that. And then Kwame, I changed people's names in the story. Oh, so he's not really named Kwame. He's not really named Kwame. Oh, bummer. I thought you you, you smoked him out. But he, um, he kind of snitched on himself in the comment section. Oh, he read it. He read it. Do you and, still talk to Kwame? Uh, just through Facebook. Like your friends on we're Facebook. friends. So your friends with Facebook Kwame, you kind of you worked it out. Mm, we just we're friends on Facebook, and so um, <laughs> <laughs> let's leave it at that. <laughs> and so he apologized in the comment thread. And what then, did he say? Um, he said he was really sorry. He didn't realize he didn't remember it, and he also didn't realize you know what kind of impact that could have. He said, I guess. I think he said something to the effect of like he was remembering other kind of jerky things he'd done to girls, but this never even like. He didn't, he didn't know what this had done. He to didn't your even. Life. Yeah, he didn't even remember it. So now that he knew, he was he apologized, and um, and then other people in the comment section realized it was him, and then they they had their own conversations with say? him. This is so interesting. The power of story twenty years later. Yes. to... I Revisit I know that some some women on. were very upset with him. Um, there was one conversation he had with a a young lady I went to college with, and they they kept going back and forth for days. So she she was just saying, you know, how kind of sexist it was, and how uh, even though he was young, like he should have known better. And where's the respect for women? So are you glad you did this? Are you glad you wrote about Kwame and published it? I am. I am. Because it was very freeing. Like, I don't have to... It's not something I am I feel like I'm hiding anymore or don't want to talk about. All right. Yeah. That's so, like, I would have never come on the radio and talked about this 20 years ago. I will ago. say you're one of the bravest people <laughs> <laughs> so far. <laughs> and your name is Stacey Graham Hunt. You have a new book out called Processing Pain. Yes. Buy it at processingpain.com. I read it. I got a lot out of it. I was really glad I read it. I think it's very well done. And Stacey's here. we got a few more minutes to talk about uh, on WNHH's Dateline New Haven. Broadcast at 103.5 FM. Live streamed at newhavenindependent.org. Another story you write about is having an abortion. Another painful moment. And that's a lot less to laugh about. But, yeah. you know, I also found that one very interesting. I'm going to tell you why. Um, but first, I'd like you to read us an excerpt about it. You went to college. Yes. And uh, where'd you go to college? Uh, this was this story took place at Florida A&M University. Where you had a boyfriend named Michael. I had a boyfriend named Michael. First Mike. love. I also changed his name, too. Okay, so, quote, Michael. Yes. And he, um, unlike Kwame, he was a pretty sensitive guy. He was sensitive. He lets um, you go at your own pace there. He did. He was a guy that um, he, when he was in high school, he was kind of like a womanizer. And then... Oh. We met each other and we clicked and then he like softened up a lot. Well, he saw that you were a prize and that you were telling him you're going to go slow and it's got to mean something. Yes. I got that. And, uh, but you ended up, you had an abortion and you guys broke up. Yes. I want you to tell us a little about the abortion. Read a segment of that from okay. Processing Pain. I would have done the same thing, my friend said. She tried to make me feel better about having an abortion. She was the one who drove me to Planned Parenthood. She told me not to look when we passed a group of protesters holding up signs of gruesomely disfigured babies. When it was all over, she was the one who drove me to her house, helped me lay down on her futon, and fed me fish sticks and french fries. I was doped up on anesthesia, which helped numb my fears about what Michael might say about me actually going through with the procedure. He wanted me to keep our baby. He was excited about the possibility of our little family. Although I wanted Michael to be the person I spent the rest of my life with, 
I wasn't ready for forever to start during my junior year in college. I had the abortion because I was scared. I was afraid of disappointing all the people who helped me get to college and stay in college. My mom paid for my private schooling, a good chunk of my college tuition, and for my rent every month. My dad sent me money every week and checked on me weekly. My grandfather, a minister, drove me to and from elementary and middle school for years. Bringing home a baby would have been so disrespectful after everything they had done for me. I was also afraid to face my friends and classmates. I didn't want to be the pregnant girl on campus. I just wanted to go to class like everyone else and be involved in a few campus activities. It all seems so shallow now. The people I was most worried about blending in with were not even a part of my life today. My child would still be here. But at the same time, it felt like a lose-lose situation. I had to choose between becoming a college mom or potentially losing everything I had with Michael. Everyone around me said education came first, so that's what I chose. After I terminated my pregnancy, as doctors say, Michael and I argued all summer. We argued about everything, missed phone calls, the tone of our voices when we spoke to each other, sneakers he wanted to buy me, a Habitat for Humanity assignment I worked on, everything. He was still in Tallahassee taking summer classes. I was in Connecticut doing a summer internship. Michael bragged about the new friends he was making that summer at school. They were all girls, of course. There was one new friend that he mentioned more than the others. Her name was Jessica. I met her my freshman year when we tried out for the same dance group. I made the dance group. She didn't. She was a much better singer than dancer, and she used her voice to gain popularity on campus. She was much more popular than I was, and I could feel Michael drifting toward her. I felt like there was nothing I could do about it from Connecticut. I felt totally out of control of everything, our relationship, my mood swings, and my guilt. I can't take this anymore, I told Michael. I'm sick of this. I kept saying things like that to him, and he believed me, and we broke up in the middle of the summer. A couple things uh, struck me about your story, Stacy. Um, one was, and tell me if I'm right about this, would the stereotype typical case be boyfriend, girlfriend, girl, woman gets pregnant, and the boy wants you to have the abortion so he doesn't have the responsibility, and the woman wants to have the baby? That's, that's what I would think. So in this case, he wanted you to have the kid, even though you were young college students. Yes. And that's an incredible prospect when you're just getting started in college and you would have this new responsibility. So, and is it my right in assuming when I read between the line here that you and Michael had something so real that long after you broke up, that spark was still there and not in sort of a flirting way. When I read the later chapters, you know, you would go see him when he had a new girlfriend, you would move down your life. You would actually go visit him. And you're always talking. He was a real soulmate. Mm -hmm. So this did, it seems like the abortion, am I wrong? Your decision to have the abortion, him wishing you had it, ended the relationship that might have been your lifelong relationship. Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, we had talked about it since then. And he, in his head, he had said, you know, I thought you would be the person that I married. And then when the abortion happened, he kind of felt like, well, what is this relationship if, you know, she's not even having my baby? Yeah. It made him question you know, the validity of the relationship. How do you feel now looking back on the abortion? Um, uh, so it's kind of twofold. Like I, I don't agree. I, I don't think I would ever have another abortion. Um, do you have other, do you have a kid? I know, but I am expecting one. Whoa. You're pregnant. <laughs> Mazel tov. When are you expecting? October. Whoa. October 12th. Congratulations. How are you Thank feeling? You. Good. I feel are you good. You passed the first trimester. Yes. I'm, I'll be Someone happy. You're in such a good mood. Five months. <laughs> I'll be five months tomorrow. Feeling good? Baby's yes. good? All mm-hmm. right. Way to go. So you said you wouldn't have another abortion. No, I wouldn't. Um, <laughs> but at the time, like, I don't blame my 19-year-old self. I th- oh, God, no. Uh, I felt, you know, I did what I felt was right at that time. And I also think that I don't, like, looking at who Michael became and who I became, I don't think we were supposed to be together. Who did Michael become? Um... <laughs> Uh, he, I know he's married and I don't, I don't want to tell all of his personal business, but he, you know, I just think our personalities are different. I think some of our challenges I might not have been able to tolerate. So. Okay. And so in retrospect, no regrets about the abortion. No, I don't. Well, 
I do I do wonder about, you know, how that child would have turned out and who that person would have become. But now you're going to be a mom. But now I'm going to be a mom, and I feel like I'm getting a second chance. All right, a point in your life when you're ready to do it. Yes. And what are you doing? Now, the book, when we last see you in the book, you've been laid off at a corporate job. Yes. So where are you now? So I've recently started a business, um, Graham Hunt Communications, and I've been helping small businesses with their social media and public relations needs. Oh, excellent. How's that going? Um, good so far. Um, I'm working with one client and perhaps another one. I'm still in negotiations with her. Uh-huh. Um, so, But good so far. I'm staying busy. Excellent. And um, we heard from Kevin James Hunt, who says, I miss you Oh, that's you my much. dad. Oh, okay. Hi, dad. Who comes out well in the book. <laughs> and uh, Ashley Carroll, go Stacy! exclamation point, exclamation point. So who are your favorite writers, Stacy? Who are my favorite writers? Um, I think it depends on what I'm looking for. I really like um, the intensity of like a sister soldier kind of book. Um, yeah, I really like her a lot. Um. I read a lot. I know they say that when you're a writer, you read a lot of books, but I actually read a lot of articles. Um, so I don't know. I like to read a little bit of everything. Or when you were in high school, what or, or what? Do you remember a book that had a big impact on you, or in college? There was this book. It was called. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of it. You caught me off guard. It's okay. But it was about this guy. He was a black student at a white private school, and he ended up either getting shot or killing himself. But I always remember that book, not the name, of course. Well, you were a black student. Hopkins was yes. mostly white. And you wrote, wrote about in your book going to a, a mother, a house of a, of a friend in Fairhaven. Oh, and you yes. you talked about how this mother talked to you so differently. Yes. From the way that other, I guess she was white. Yes. Parents talked. No, I didn't change her name. Her name, uh, that was Corey's mom. Corey's mom. And Corey's yeah. mom, and, and I'm trying to remember, I guess I didn't mark that part in the book for you to read about how Corey's mom dealt with you differently from um other people and what did she do exactly she just treated me like one of her kids like and i felt like when i went to other parents houses that they like either went out of their way too much like i went to one friend's house and her mom made like collard greens oh that's and, right you talked about I, it you get this, like <laughs> lousy soul food yeah and, and i was like i know that you guys don't eat this like why don't just make this because i'm here um and another friend, I went to her house, and she had an older brother, and her older brother had invited somebody over black that day. And I was just oh, like... Oh, sort of like, you know, let's invite the black people. Yeah, yeah, it just felt... And you also talked about her listening to you. Yes. That she just, was interesting. She just looked at me, and she just wanted to know what I had to say. She didn't ask me, like, any questions about being black. or the, Blackness never came up. It was just like, you're my daughter's friend, and you're here to play, and I'm just... The other friends who made a big deal of trying to cook soul food and stuff, did they listen well when you were talking? They listened well. Like, we were good friends, but... So the interesting thing about the the one who made the soul food, (laughs) her mom that made the soul food. So I had a sleepover one summer. I think I was 10 years old. And I invited everybody in my class. This is at St. Thomas's. I invited everybody in my class. And... um, but none of the kids from my class, they were all like on summer vacations and stuff. And so my friends from my, my neighborhood and my dancing school, they all came and they were black. So she ended up being the only white person at my black, you know, well, it wasn't a black sleepover, but just all my black friends came. And so her mom was uncomfortable about leaving her there and said to my, <laughs> said to my mom, like, you You're know. You're going to protect her, make sure she doesn't get you, Yeah, you know, you know, she, she's the only one here. And then my mom, you know eloquently said well how do you think stacy feels when she's mm. you know at- how did stacy feel being in a mostly white school um when i was young i didn't really think about it in elementary school you know people would ask like my friends how often do you wash your hair or, you know you'd get little questions like that but then when you get it for years and years and years and now you're 15 16 17 and you're still hearing these kind of questions it's like okay now don't you know don't you know more than just me Am I the one black person, you know? So I think what ended up happening is I got tired of that. And so I ended up going to Florida A&M University. You went to historically black college. Yes. I wanted a different experience. That's so interesting. Well, Stacey Graham Holt, it's been such a pleasure first reading your book. Thank you. I wish you so much success with it. Processing Pain by Stacey Graham Hunt. And you just type that in on the internet. Processing Pain. 
com, and you can read the book too. Thank, thank you for having me. Yeah, was, and there's so much more to talk about, but it's in the book. Yes. And a special thanks to Yale Haven Hospital for providing support for today's program. Thanks for the listeners and the people sending comments. We're going to take it out with the Afro-Semitic experience performing I Wish I Knew How It Feel to Be Free from the group CD, A Plea for Peace. Now we know what it's like to be free. We just got to remember to book our flight. Book your flight with us all day and all night long here at WNHH, New Haven's home for community radio.